Recently, I saw a beer mat and written on it was something I'd never seen before. And it was a question, actually quite an important question, and the question was simply, is the hokey pokey really what it's all about? It reminded me of different times in church. I would look around and I would think to myself, what is this all about? What is church all about? What are we here for? I wonder what the Bible has to say about that. Well, that's something we're going to unpack together in the next few minutes. So let's just pray. Father, I pray that you will uphold me, that Jesus Christ may be uplifted. In his name I pray. Amen. So what is it all about? What is being a Christian, being part of God's family, the church, all about? What are we here for? Well, let's go back to the rule book, the guidebook, uh, the book that we believe is divinely inspired. And really from beginning to end, one of the things that is quite clear is that from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, it is abundantly clear that the God we worship is a God of mission, a missional God. The very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis, the story of creation. God creates different parts of the creation and in verse 22 in Genesis 1, we read these words, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the sea and let the birds increase in the earth. So here we have in the very first book of the Bible, God blessing. And one of the outcomes of the blessing is fruitfulness, fullness, abundance, multiplication. Fast forward a little bit in Genesis and we come to that well-known rainbow figure, Noah. And again, we read that God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Genesis 9, verse 1. Again, a direct link between God's blessing and fruitfulness. Really at the foundation of an understanding of our God being a God of mission is Genesis chapter 12, where we're introduced to this remarkable figure, Abraham, better known to all of us as Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Isn't that remarkable? Here we have a vision that encompasses the whole earth. People of every nation, every tribe, every language, every color. God is choosing to bless Abraham in order that all nations will be blessed. And you know, fast forward and that's exactly what has happened in the history of God's people. You have the vertical dimension, God blesses us, and then the horizontal, so that we then become a blessing to others. This is the way God works. Blessing is not for us to hold on to jealously. It's for sharing, it's for giving away. God has called his people to be a blessing to the whole world, all nations. The prophets emphasize the all nations dimension as well. When we go to the book of the prophet Isaiah, we see again and again in Isaiah a God who is the God of all nations. Isaiah 52, verses 7 to 10. <clears throat> How beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation 
of our God. You see, the tradition that you and I are a part of is not some narrow, sectarian understanding of a particular nationality. No, it is God bringing together a company of redeemed people, people he has blessed, a special people, a unique people, and he calls us together to use us, to help us, to bless others, to give away what, she, what he has given. He's a generous God, and he has called you and I to acts of generosity as well. Sometimes, let's be honest, our vision is so narrow. Recently, my wife and I were in a car, and we were listening to the program I was going to preach. It was a Sunday morning, and uh, <clears throat> the presenter quoted a Church of England bishop who apparently said recently that sometimes in our parishes we have the brakes of a juggernaut, a huge lorry, and we have the engine of a lawnmower, a tiny little engine. Because our mentality sometimes is, let's put the brakes on everything. We are here just as a little private club. We enjoy it, we love it, and uh, we're just happy the way we are. But folks, that's solar systems away from what God's vision for the church is. Jesus made that absolutely clear. And indeed, you remember, um, just after he was born, that wonderful elderly man, Simeon, held the young Jesus in his arms. Um, all my life, I've been attending Anglican churches, and one of my favorite services, although actually in our country, in Ireland, it doesn't happen very, more, uh, very much anymore, is the service of evening prayer. Every time we have evening prayer, we either say or sing the Song of Simeon. We call it the Nunc Dimittis. Do you remember those words? Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Do you see the worldwide vision? Again, Christ has come, not just for the Jews, the people of Israel. He has come for the Gentiles as well. Thank God he has, or I wouldn't be talking the way I am right now. I'm a Gentile. But God's vision is for Gentiles and Jews, slave and free, rich and poor. But what about your vision and mine? as a local parish, a local church. How wide, how broad is our vision? Is it narrow? Are we just focusing on ourselves? Or have we caught this vision that God has that was expressed so clearly in Jesus? You remember at the beginning of his public ministry, Luke chapter four, he goes to the synagogue in the town where he was brought up, Nazareth, he stands up to read the scriptures in that synagogue. And what does he read? Words from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. His mission is all about others. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3, verse 16. Who is it God loves? Just a particular group of people? No, the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is the vision that he has. But the key question is, in our parishes, is this the vision we have? Because that's the way God wants it to be. We see it worked out in the lives of Paul the Apostle. Peter, one of the best friends of Jesus. Peter talks about the people of God as being a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We are called to declare the wonderful deeds of him who has called us out of darkness into light. Right through the New Testament, 
there is this emphasis on reaching out, sharing, giving, being a reflection of God's perfection, loving the world as he loves the world. Even the last book of the Bible, Revelation, some people call it revolutions, and actually maybe that's not totally far away from what it actually is, because it is revolutionary. But there too we have a vision of heaven. People from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. I can't wait for heaven. That will be the most international gathering that has ever existed. And it's forever. Perfection. And we're to enjoy that with people from every nation and every generation. So let's just do a little reality check. As you think of your parish, and I think of the parish I belong to, is our life reflecting anything of that kind of vision? Are we a church that reaches out to others? Are we a church that thinks of others? In my opinion, one of the model churches in the New Testament is the church of Antioch. <laughs> Having said that, I must explain the definition of model. Uh, there used to be a famous Anglican in England called Canon David Watson, who I heard him say on some occasions, my wife says I am a model husband. And I remember thinking, what an arrogant man he is. And then he said, but her definition of model is a poor replica of the real thing. This church in Antioch, actually, I think is a good replica of the real thing. Because this was a church that looked outwards. This was a church that cared for new Christians. This was a church that cared for needy Christians. They were willing to give to people in another part of that world, another part of the Roman Empire, who were going through a time of severe famine. They were thinking of others. They cared for people's bodies, souls. They cared for the whole person. See, I think one of our biggest challenges today is we live in a selfie culture. Back home in Ireland, the most popular photograph at the moment is, yeah, it's all about me. It's called a selfie. What a description. It's a follow on from Frank Sinatra, isn't it? I did it my way. And when we look at our parishes, are we selfie parishes? Or are we parishes that have caught the vision of God? We're to be missional, just like our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, in some ways, to talk about a missional church is a little bit of a nonsense. It's like talking about a female woman. Actually, a woman, by definition, is female. And the church, by definition, is a group of mission-minded, mission-committed people. That's part of our DNA. There's a local church I know of, and there's a wonderful rector who's leading that parish. It has grown enormously over the last 20 years. It's in a part of the United States, and about 20 years ago, there were 40, 50 people there. Now there's about 1,800 in that parish. And one of the significant factors in the growth and development of that parish is that as a parish that looks out. They look to God, the God of mission, and they seek to be a reflection of his perfection. You see, for some parishes, one sentence sums us up. It's all about us. What's God's vision? It's to be all about him and them, the people out there. So that's God's call. And I would really encourage you to do a little reality check. And let's ask ourselves, are we the kind of church that God has called us to be? With this I finish. Back home in Northern Ireland where I live, there's a wonderful Anglican church in East Belfast. They are really impacting the community. This is a church in the community for the community. And they are part of a community that is saturated with social problems, dysfunctional relationships. This church is a generous church. This is a church committed to acts of kindness, being the kind of church God has called us to be. They are impacting this community big time, big time. Not so long ago, a lady in that community said this, 
I'm not a Christian. I don't go to church. I don't know if there is a God or not. But I don't want this community without that church. And she pointed to the building of that church. I wonder in how many places people would be saying that. I don't want this community without that church. That's what people begin to say when we are the kind of church God has called us to be. A church with a local vision and a church with a global vision. Let's go for it. God bless you as you work. Work out being the church God has called us to be. Thank you.